Well, I will have a, a short introduction without any further ado. Um, so, this is our first uh, keynote lecture on the first day of our conference uh, by Boris Bud entitled Those Who Make Revolution Halfway. I'll just have a little uh, bio, uh, <coughs> biography or quotes from, from uh, Boris Budin's biography and then we, we should start with uh, his lecture. Uh, Boris Budin is a writer, cultural critic and translator. He studied philosophy in Zagreb and received his PhD in cultural theory from Humboldt University in Berlin. In the 1990s, uh, he founded and was editor of the magazine and publishing house Argzin in Zagreb. He's board member of European Institute for Progressive Cultural Policies in Vienna. His essays and articles cover topics related to philosophy, politics, translation, uh, linguistics, the post-communist condition, and cultural and art criticism. Among his translate, translations into Croatian are some of the most important works by Sigmund Freud. He has co-edited and authored several books, including uh, Tone der Übergangs from Ende des Postcommunismus, uh, Übersetzung des Versprechen eines Begriffes, uh, and the Schacht, uh, Schacht von Babel is Kutu Ibezetsba. Uh, in Croatian, he edited uh, and, and he published uh, his books Katowski Kodwar, Putic Kese uh, in 2002 and Barricade in two, uh, 1996. He is a currently visiting professor at the Faculty of Art and Design, Bauhaus University, Weimar. Uh, Boris Budin lives and works in Berlin. So, Boris, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Is it? Ah, it's for the camera. Okay. <laughs> so I'm supposed to speak loudly, and I will. Okay. So uh, thank you for the for the invitation. And uh, uh, Tom uh, actually and and the organizers commissioned uh, commissioned me to give as in in this first keynote a sort of a general context of of the problem of or processes of uh, privatization, <clears throat> which is in itself, you know, a, a, a quite a problem to give a context. First, um, this is also interesting that uh, you have uh, somehow localized these processes of uh, privatization in what is called here region, and uh, it's a sort of a synonym, a synonym for a former Yugoslavia or probably a wider space, yeah. the Balkans, I don't know. Anyway, the region. So, and it is implicitly, <clears throat> um, it implies that, that uh, this geographical space is also cer a certain time space in terms of a post-communist condition. However, the problem with the post-communist uh, condition is <clears throat> that usually it has been geographically uh, and culturally uh, localized in terms of a space of the former socialist countries of, of, of like Eastern Europe. So that, uh, speaking about post-communism, we uh, somehow automatically, automatically uh, um, uh, locate the, this condition to this certain geographical and cultural space, or as I will later show you, a time, time space. But uh, uh, as in, in my, uh, my book, uh, I argue that if there is uh, post-communist condition, it has a global meaning. And uh, uh, not only the, the, the former East, but, but the West and the world as such in its global condition is a post-communist. And I will uh, uh, try uh, to, to show why it is so. So coming back to the question, what is the context of this pri privatization? If we say post-communism, then we have uh, uh, to deal with a certain global global condition. Another question is, as you know, if you say a context, you automatically think of historical context, political context, cultural context, or economic, economical context. Uh, this last economic co context I will leave uh, for the experts later to deal with uh, in, in, a, in a much uh, better way that I I, am, uh, I will be uh, <clears throat> able to do, and I will try to tackle these other three or four meanings of the contexts, 
And, and I must say from the very beginning, it is very difficult. There are major difficulties in, 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 in trying to depict, to sketch out this, what, what does it mean today, context. Take first the historical context. Privatization in a historical context. Well, the difficulty, uh, the difficulty begins already if we remember that precisely these days is an anniversary of a quite important text that was published precisely 25 years ago, spring 89, uh, the text by Fukuyama, The End of History, with a question mark. It was the text published uh, in, uh, uh, in the magazine, American magazine, National Interest. Few months later, uh, 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 actually, uh, 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 later, the, uh, the book, <coughs> three years, not, not months later, the book was published, The End of History and the Last Man, but without a question mark. So this was <coughs> in the book, it pronounced Fukuyama authoritatively, uh, that we have reached the end point of mankind's ideological evolution. So the, the, the Western type of, type of liberal democracy is, so to say, the last ideological word of, of history, the universal, respectively, the final form of human government. The, the end of history, as Fukuyama <coughs> uh, uh, conceived of it, is, of course, uh, not the beginning of an epoch in which nothing happens, no, <coughs> nothing significantly happens. He didn't mean the end of all battles, of all struggles, political or military, but merely the end of ideological battles. Not all societies are supposed to become successful liberal democracies, but whatever a system, whatever regime, whatever a society will be no able to challenge liberal democracy ideologically, to claim a superiority over this final type of human government. So the argument about the end of history has primarily an ideological and political meaning. Applied to the phenomenon of, of privatization, it means, now we are coming back to the question how to contextualize the processes of privatization. It, it means privatization is not a historical process. Rather, it is a side phenomenon, of course, from this perspective of the end of, of history, a side phenomenon of a general post-historical condition. Translated concretely, it is a side phenomenon of the Western liberal, liberal democracy, which cannot be challenged ideologically. Consequently, privatization cannot be, cannot be questioned ideologically either. One can challenge it politically, fight it or defend it, kill for it or die for it or against it. But this struggle has no longer place in any ideological, that is, historical perspective or vision. It is historically and ideologically of no importance whatsoever within this uh, uh, context of the post-history as defined by, by Fukuyama. Um, as you probably know, since then, uh, Fukuyama's claim has been, uh, has been many times refuted. Al al already in uh, 1993, uh, uh, Misha Glenny published, published the book dealing precisely with, with the conflict in, in uh, former Yugoslavia, with, with war, wars in former Yugoslavia. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the title was The Re Rebirth of, of History. Under the same uh, 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 title appeared 2012, Alain uh, uh, Badiou's book, uh, with a subtitle, Times of Riots and, and Uprisings. So the rebirth of history, times of riots and, and, and uprisings, referring concretely to the so-called Arab revolutions. Uh, 
<clears throat> or in the same years, 2012, uh, a Guardian columnist, Seumas Milne, uh, published the book, The Revenge of History. But actually, we don't have, we don't have to ask philosophers, historians, um, um, uh, op so-called opinion makers, uh, which is the, the, uh, the name for the former public intellectuals, <clears throat> to tell us that, that, uh, uh, that something, uh, that even after the proclaimed end of history, something is still happening in the world. But the question is, is this what is happening around us? And what is today, these days, as you know, we are talking again <laughs> about uh, 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 Cold War, Cold War II, or it, it's not, these days, it's, it's, it's not cold anymore. It's becoming hot, hotter every day. So we don't, <clears throat> we don't need them to tell us. We see that something is happening now. But the question is, is this the history? Is this really that history which Fukuyama, at the end of his article, put exp explicitly at the end of article, in the last sentences, he puts it into museum. I. I quote, in the post-historical period, there will be neither art nor philosophy, just the perpetual caretaking of the museum of human history. This is especially interesting. We are supposed, you know, to deal with the art, art exhibition. This is a art context. But you know, even this can be put in question, whether the context, conceptually, the context of this e event is really framed by an art exhibition, or what we call still, probably not knowing enough, art, art exhibition is something else. So, <clears throat> and uh, even uh, I would hardly claim that I'm philosopher, you know, <laughs> talking about these things. So, there is neither art nor philosophy, but perpetual caretaking of a museum of history. What does it mean for the phenomenon of privatization? First, that the condition that has been transformed by pri pri privatization, you know, this, what has been changed by the processes, or processes of privatization, the condition we might conceive of in terms of, you know, like, be it a public space, or something common, or something uh, 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 social, or something that belongs to a state. In any case, a meaning broader than simply the mode of property. So, uh, so <clears throat> this condition, uh, 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 yes, the, it, the, the change is in, in, in terms that that it uh, hasn't simply disappeared what has been changed by, by privatization, however we call it, but it has been uh, relocated, displaced into a museum together with history. In other words, we can perceive it and deal, it, deal with it in a way one perceives and deals with a museum exhibit. The struggles, this has further consequences. The struggles around privatization, they are somehow obvious. And now I'm, I'm going to put it very, you know, in a very strong terms, what I think, what is the transformation, and what is the, 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 the difficulty in, in, in dealing with this phenomenon. And I know it will sound very strange, but the, its metaphorical meaning is of great cognitive value. So, the struggle around a privatization have a character of a curatorial prax practice. I know, it's, it, it, to put it in Lacanian terms, it is only on the imaginary level that we can talk about, for instance, a destruction of, or, of public, or, uh, or public space or social space. It's only on, the, on an imaginary level. 
It is precisely by putting it into museum that privatization symbolically generate the timeless absence of public or social space. You know, when you put something into a museum, you change the modus that of, of, of time, of, of the thing it is in museum. You, you create a sort of uh, 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 timelessness or we used to call it eternity <laughs> in the 19th se century, but we, we produce a, a, a new mode of time, which is a timelessness. These, these are things that are, that are, that are um, <clears throat> supposed to be beyond time. So <clears throat> it is the past that has become eternal, or it is our duty to take care of it so that it becomes eternal. So that uh, the, the presence of, be it history, be it social, be it public space, the presence in a museum makes it timeless, places it out of history, or if you like, into a history that is nothing but merely an exhibit in a museum, a piece of heritage, a cultural heritage. Can you think of society as being nothing but a cultural heritage? a cultural heritage, we, we can, we should, we are supposed to, or as Fukuyama would say, this is our first duty to take care of. But it is, it is in, the, in the museum. <clears throat> and consequently, I'm, I'm uh, playing with, with, with uh, Lacanian differences between the imaginary, symbolically, uh, uh, imag imaginary, symbolic, and, and real. And uh, consequently, it is this absence from history and ideology of public space, of society, a void that cannot be symbolized, that structures the real of the post-historical world. You know, in, in Lacanian terms, uh, something you cannot symbolize produces a void. But this void is what structures the, the real, what, what, what is the real. And the problem is that what, again, what has been transformed by the privatization has fallen into this void and cannot be cannot be symbolized. And this is precisely what structures uh, uh, the real today. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the real of the post-historical world, of a world in which the co consequences of privatization, for instance, its social, cons of, uh, its social consequences, cannot be challenged as such. So, the way of our dealing with what has been transformed, or if you like, destroyed by privatizations, cannot be perceived in terms of activism or an artistic practice. Rather, it is, as Fukuyama says, a form of caretaking, protecting, as one protects Arctic ice from melting away. So we, 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 are, we hope you know, to protect society or social welfare state from being dismantled. But it's about protecting. It's about uh, uh, caretaking. <clears throat> it's about you know, preserving something from the past. And to repeat, privatization is not a destructive force. Rather, it is a force of relocation, displacement, and eventually of, of a replacement. For instance, history that has been put into museum uh, hasn't simply disappeared. <clears throat> it has been replaced by something else. So the place of history in the so-called reality has been reoccupied by something else. In the same year as Fukuyama published The End of History, as you know, 89, the, 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 the first of a chain of the so-called democratic revolutions uh, happened, and, and uh, this is what we uh, today think of as the collapse of communism. But it is this threshold, threshold on the, on the timeline of history. 89 means the collapse of, of communism. 
Interestingly, French historian Pierre Nora dates back to this event, 89, the, 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 the fall of communism, uh, as a historical threshold, another important turn, the turn from history to memory. Now, according to Nora, the meaning of memory has broadened so much that it is now, nowadays used simply as a replacement, as a substitute for history. The study of history, he argues, is now at the service of memory. If once there was a collective history and individual memory, now the memory has acquired collective meaning. Since memory has dethroned history from its sole rule over the past, we have been witnessing, as Nora argues, I quote, a worldwide upsurge in memory. <clears throat> What is for Fukuyama the post-historical period as the general condition in which we live today is for Nora, Nora the age of commemoration in a similar post-historical sense. It is an age, as Nora writes, of, I quote, passionate, almost fetishistic memorialism in which every country, every social, ethnic, or family group has undergone a profound change in its relation, uh, in, in, in the relationship it traditionally enjoyed with the past. He compares this historically grown interest in the past with, I quote, a kind of tidal wave of memorial concerns that has broken over the world. Our representations of the past, now shaped by memory, not by history, no longer by history. If we perceive the past through, through, the, through the glasses of memory, so to say, it's not the history, no longer. So <clears throat> our representations of the past now shaped by memory decisively determine the understanding of our relation to reality in all of its manifestations, social, political, cultural, etc. This is why I'm talking about this, this major difficulty, you know, to, to, to conceive of a context of privatization. It is, <clears throat> it is the problem itself. It, it's not about, you know, giving, depicting, illustrating something around an event. It is the, 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 the event itself. The past we are talking about so much here, um, has abandoned the place it had been occupied for long, long, for so long on the timeline of history. You know, it's a time when we, uh, we were able to differentiate be between the past, the present, and the future. The unity of historical time, as Nora argues, has been broken. The present is now no, not able to connect the past with the future. Not only we are helplessly confused in finding again the proper location of the past, the change went uh, 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 deeper than that. The past has ceased altogether to exist as dimension of historical temporality. When we refer to it today, we no longer refer, refer to history, but directly to the whole spectrum of our existence, before all, to our social being. Some hundreds of years ago, uh, Maurice Halbwachs, Halbwachs, who was actually a student um, of Henri Bergson, and you know, Henri Bergson uh, uh, conceptualized um, or, or uh, developed the philosophy of memory, but in, in an individual sense, memory in an individual sense. What Maurice Halbwachs did and he was a sociologist, and this is the time of society, the time of, of sociology. He put the memory into a social frame. Uh, uh, so, le cadre, memo, uh, uh, le cadre socio de mémoire, the, 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 the social frame of the memory. So, he put the memory into, into the social frame and uh, 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 invented the collective meaning of, of memory. 
This happened precisely in the time when social imagination almost completely turned to the future. And as, as you probably uh, know, Boris Groys defines the collapse of communism as, as uh, the way back from the future, return from the future. So this is the time of this modern, modern development of, of, of uh, 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 society, socialism, social welfare state uh, that is uh, decisively attached to uh, one dimension of time, the future. And we are now somehow supposed uh, to, uh, to having been returned from the future. <clears throat> so what I'm suggesting now, in the age of post history and commemoration, is that we also should reverse the move, but this time by putting society into the frame of memory. So it's the other way. If 100 years ago, Halbwax put the memory into the frame of society, I suggest, I'm suggesting, to put the society into the frame of memory. Our sole relation to the past. What I'm evoking is perhaps a certain memorial meaning of society. As it, its only meaning we can still grasp. This reversal necessarily implies a different perception of the past. It becomes the past now, a temporal dimension of, of the post-historical sociality. I will try to explain. What then in, in, in this context the phrase of social effects of privatization mean? Uh, 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 means privatization is a social phenomenon. And there is no doubt about it. But its social character, character can be understood only from a post-historical perspective. So the social context of privatization, whatever its effects, can be grasped from in, in, in a way, um, I say, you know, I say retrospective, not pros uh, 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 perspective. Our entire social imaginary today is haunted by an overall retrospectivity. The past is not simply a dimension of time, especially not in a historical sense. Rather, it is the general modus of our understanding the world and taking our stand in it as a social beings, political animals, and cultural identities. It is not possible for us today to enter a social conflict, to fight a political struggle, or to occupy a cultural location without stepping into the past as a platform of social activity, as a political battleground, as a stage of cultur cultural articulation, as a screen of utopian imagination, and last but not least, as a museum in which we take care of history. And additionally, as you know, as you, if, you, if you saw the exhibition, and you see how the problem of privatization and what it implies a society having been dismantled or, 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 or whatever by privatization, how it is down there, there the memory telling the story about it. From, uh, from, 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 from a retrospective. You know, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, artworks with the timelines. They're their own timelines. They don't address, they don't consult history as a knowledge of, uh, uh, as, as objective, uh, as a knowledge of the past based on, uh, on ac accurate objective uh, uh, facts. Nobody asks about it. Everybody can, everybody, not only artists, sketch out its own, his or her own timeline. But it is memory, it's not history. It is memory in the exhibition. And this exhibition is also about the memory. And just go there and see it. Which is, which is very interesting, we can discuss it later. You know, this is the longing for being able to learn from history, to, to uh, 
relaunch the meaning of the of what this uh, famous uh, Cicero proverb Historia et est magistra vitae used to mean 2,000 years ago, you know, by not only by Cicero but Thucydides and the Roman historians, and and Gada translates it uh, uh, as 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 um, as a memory of life. Historia magistra vitae, which is a memory uh, of, of life, which means you know the history, you are able to tell the history only if you have witnessed the, 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 the event or if you heard the story of, of someone who has witnessed the event. This is the witnessing of, of event. This is how you can learn from the past. In the history, says you cannot learn from the past because from the history you cannot learn from it because history is a space of a new experience. So history is a subject that creates something new. How can you learn about it? Because you know a revolution creates something new. You cannot know how it. This is the space of experience. But now. This, this experience is accessible only through memory, not through, through the so-called objective knowledge of, of history. So, <clears throat> this, uh, the, the same, of course, applies to the social meaning of privatization. It hasn't been simply left in the past. Rather, it is a phenomenon, I'm repeating, past, sociality. How then to make politics with the social con consequences of privatization? This is what is at stake. You know, how to make politics with the effects of privatization. As it is generally known, the post-socialist politics is no longer concerned with social issues. This is its major character. This is the feature. It's no longer concerned with social problems, for instance. It seems as though society is no longer capable of articulating itself politically. One can go even a step f uh, further and ask, does society in post-socialism exist at all? At stake is more than a society that has fallen politically silent, that has become politically speechless, that is incapable of both articulating and addressing its authentic issues. We are rather dealing with something I would call a non-addressable society. And we should imagine it in terms of Alt Althusser's famous, you know, this formula, example of um, uh, how ideology works about uh, a police officer shouting on the streets to, uh, to a person, hey, you there. By mere response to this exclamation, by turning around 480 grades, degree, a person becomes a subject. So ideology is not simply a set of ideas, but it is a mechanism that produces social subjectivity. And in what we call post-socialism, it is society as such that cannot be interpelled into subject. This is what I mean when I say that society has fallen silent and therefore no longer exist. exists. It doesn't respond to the exclamations made by people. It doesn't turn around when people complain, when they express their social pain, for instance. Is it necessary to remind, to remind you of an enormous amount of social pain that has been produced? And we have been, we, we have been witnessing it around. This is what we see the public space, the pain, the social pain. And it, it has been uh, produced by the so-called post-social transition. Millions of workers who, who, who were sucked not only by the criminal privatizations, but by the politically and ideologically facilitated and accelerated collapse of industrial modernism and dismantling of the socialist welfare state. Or think of more radical forms of social di uh, dissolution, like, like we have we, we, we were witnessing in, 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 the, in, the, in the 90s the, the, the civil wars. Yet this pain 
although suffered individually, has no longer has been no longer felt socially. In other words, despite of being called in to intervene, the society doesn't turn around, doesn't respond. I translated more than 25 years ago uh, a, a book by a German uh, psychoanalyst and a uh, member of the late Frankfurt School, Alfred Lorenzer, and Habermas took from Lorenzer quite a lot in his whole, whole uh, 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 concept uh, uh, of liberal, uh, liberal philosophy. And the title was uh, 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 Psychoanalyse of Socialist Light, Psychoanalysis and Social Pain. Well, it, this, this book is of no use today. You know, there is no social pain. There are only individual manifestations of pain. So, I mean, <clears throat> This is, the, we, we can talk about it in a sort of, of uh, anesthetic, general anesthetic. Society is anesthetic. It doesn't feel. Only individuals feel. And this brings us back to the famous, famous <coughs> sentence uh, by Margaret Thatcher uh, in the late 80s, there is no such thing as society. Which, which has, of course, performative me uh, meaning. She was not a sociologist, you know, finding out suddenly after reading 100 books that so society doesn't exist. She destroyed the society. So, uh, so there's no such things because I, I, I destroyed it. <laughs> <clears throat> but what has left? Individuals, <coughs> individuals and families. This is precisely what you have. You have individuals and you have, you have conservative movements. To, uh, to take care of, of uh, what is the next important to individuals, which is the family, <clears throat> as a replacement and the leftover of a society. So you can address society as much as you can. It won't respond. It responds only individually or through families, through how is this creation in, in family, the, in the name of family. In the name, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's society responds in the name of family, no. No, no longer in its own name. <clears throat> However, we cannot say that society has enti entirely vanished. It has survived in its translations. It is speechless indeed. It cannot be uh, addressed in its own language, yet it can be still evoked in its cultural translations. And as Benjamin uh, <clears throat> Uh, 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 concepts of translation as an afterlife of or, or original. So these cultural translations are form of an afterlife of, of society. At stake is the culturalization of the political. Not only are political conflicts directly translated into cultural, often in the self-representation of the parties involved in the con conflict, but the very cause of the conflicts is culturally explained as well. Nancy Fraser described 20 years ago one of the main features of the post-socialist age as a shift in the grammar of political struggle from, uh, 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 from demands uh, for social justice to the demands for the so-called justice of uh, recognition meaning the recognition of difference in terms of nationality, ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, etc. In Fraser's words, the, the demand for justice of, of redistribution, this is how she thinks of socialism. It is, it is also quite liberal American uh, 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 way of thinking of what is socialism. That socialism is about justice, of, of, of not about revolution, not, but you know, it's a justice. We, we should have some <clears throat> uh, proper laws as to, as to be happy. <clears throat> so uh, justice of redistribution has been replaced by demand for a justice of recognition. This defines the so-called post-socialist world as a world in which the majority of political demands use the language of culture, of the struggle for recognition between culturally defined groups or communities of values, Western values, you know, etc., uh, European values, 
whose objective is to defend their identities, to end cultural domination and win recognition, etc. Identity has become the chief medium of political mobilization. This is what we usually call politics. Thus, there is a major difficulty in making politics with the social effects of privatizations. The problem is that, quite generally, the post-socialist condition is not a social condition. Rather, it is a cultural identity. Not a social condition, but a cultural identity. And the name of the cultural identity is the East. In fact, the historical event called the Democratic Revolution of 1890, or more descriptively, the fall of communism, was culturally localized. More precisely, it was Easternized. Not only did it happen in the East, but it happened because of the East. At stake is no less than the historical meaning of the whole event. We are now, you know, we are now dealing with the meaning of this revolution, 1890, what they really uh, meant or mean still. <clears throat> It takes no less than the historical meaning of it. Already in 1990, uh, uh, Jürgen Habermas defined these revolutions in terms of, uh, as, he, as, as he called it, the Rückspülende Revolution, the rewinding uh, 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 revolution, or the Nach, even more concretely, the Nachholende revol uh, Revolution, the catching up revolution. So, the toppling of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, so he, his argument goes, has cleared the way for the expansion of modernity towards the East, from the West, of course, that had been blocked for decades by the totalitarian rule. So, it was, it was the modernity, but only in the West, and the, the, the Eastern socialism was uh, an obstacle for the Western modernity, you know, to spread, to spread to the to the to the East, and the fall of communism, the obstacle was removed, so that the modernity uh, arrived finally into the East, and the whole process of the catching up with the missed development, missed uh, in terms of modernity, could start again. This is very problematic deeply problematic definition. And it is historically even, even uh, 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 not difficult to put it into question. But this is generally, this is generally how the, 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 the revolutions of 89 were understood. And this is generally how the so-called process of transition is conceived. This is how people believe what is at stake after the fall. You know how we all, how in Croatia people believe that they have to they have to catch up with something that exists already there, like in Europe, and it is it is a, a, a properly functioning capitalism, perfect democracy, rule of law, etc. And we are belated. Since we are belated, we need some time to 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 transform so as to catch up with this development we missed because we were uh, victims of uh, uh, communist totalitarianism. So this is this general, general, um, so it, you know, it deals with so-called normal modernist development. Normal, which means in the Western. This is what the whole historical event is supposed to be about. It should have enabled the East to finally catch up with the missed modernist development. Of course, the modernity that is meant here is a we Western modernity, which curiously doesn't make it particular. Quite the contrary. Western modernity is supposed to be universal, to be modernity as such. It's tautology to say Western modernity. It's the modernity. On the other side, this could be very interesting, you know, uh, to discuss uh, uh, the idea of uh, modernity as a cultural, Western cultural form and to ask, how was it actually possible that we can talk about Chinese modernity, South American modernity, like uh, African modernity? How was it possible that, that this particularly Western cultural form 
was able or uh, uh, that it was possible to translate it into all other cultural contexts and, and, and geographical regions. This is what is universal, not the, 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 the place, the location, but the capability, the translatability. This is what is universal, not, not, uh, not, not simply that, that there are there, you know, a set of values and, and uh, Obama, Merkel and, and Cameroon are in the possession of them. <clears throat> On the other side, the notion of East doesn't imply universal values. Moreover, it implies no values at all, for its meaning is defined exclusively through its relation to the West. As, as, as you know, uh, uh, Gramsci, Gramsci already, he knew that every, every place on earth is at the same time, west and east, north, north and south. But these are cultural constructions with ideolo ideological meaning. <clears throat> so, in short, the east is belated. It means not yet to be. That's how we can define the East. It is a cultural distance in time, a form in which the former Cold War divide has survived the collapse of communism, in the trope of a chronically belated, underdeveloped, backward East. According to Rasko Mochnik, Slovenian philosopher, the West is divide, has survived the collapse of communism. You know, it has survived before they had survived before they have started to talk about Cold War II and all this conflict now, now in Ukraine. It has been there all the time, the uh, East uh, West divide. Actually, the very concept of transition is a form of, 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 of survival of this divide. So <clears throat> it has survived the collapse of communism primarily due to its ideological function, which is to rob both sides, both sides, the West and the East, of its history, of their history. So not only the, the East uh, <clears throat> has been robbed uh, 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 of, of its history, the West too. The West appears nowadays as emancipated, not only from its own history, but no, uh, moreover, from history as such. The West is timeless. It is beyond the historical time. It's universal. This is why it can be imposed as, as general and canonic. The Western values are canonic. <clears throat> the notion of East, on the contrary, functions as amnesia, that's Mochnik's uh, idea, amnesia whose purpose is to get and to become an ahistorical known space as the West. Its own history is what makes the East peripheral and provincial, being victim of communist totalitarianism, which stopped normal development, so we are belated, etc. <clears throat> it does has a history of the East, but a history that, as Mochnik uh, uh, writes, would be better forgotten. Or we may, uh, we may add in words of Habermas a history that has to be rewound. It is not difficult to demonstrate how this frozen cultural difference between West and East generates historical oblivion and is at the same time perpetuated by this same oblivion. Take the examples now of, of these uh, events in Ukraine now. Take the way how probably you have seen how uh, the memory, and it is about memories, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> chief medium in dealing with the past, how the memory of uh, uh, Lenin has been dealt with. I mean, concretely, the Lenin monuments. As you know, in the eastern Ukraine, where there are uh, pro-Europe, European nationalists, they, they destroyed topple uh, down these the monuments, Lenin uh, monuments. Uh, um, uh, at the same time, in the eastern part, we see people gathering around these monuments, protecting them. You know, in the, in the west Ukraine, it is destroyed memory of Lenin. In the eastern part, 
you know, it's, it's protected, it's guarded by the people. So this is, this is very interesting. So, and, and in, in the East, you know, people, uh, people uh, protect Lenin monument, calling at the same time for Putin and Mother Russia to protect them, to even, to even, to even them, to support their cause, and eventually annex the Eastern country. This is the same Putin who a few weeks or months ago, in this famous speech in, in accused Bolsheviks and communists of dismantling, of dismembering uh, uh, Russia. So, you know, they, they are the culprits, and at the same time, Lenin is, is protected by them. Hmm. <clears throat> and that he is now, you know, Putin identified with, 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 with historical role of correcting the wrongdoings, doings of Bolsheviks and communists. As it is well known, it were precisely Bolsheviks and Lenin who broke with, with and reversed the politics of Tsarist Russian imperialism. They established Ukrainian statehood in the form of Soviet Republic. They introduced the Ukrainization policy. It was Bolsheviks in the 20s. And encouraged a national renaissance in literature and the arts. You know, Ukrainian language. It was encouraged by Bolsheviks. It was under Lenin and Bolsheviks that Ukrainian culture and language enjoyed a revival. And the Ukrainization became a local implementation of the Soviet-wide policy of those who speak uh, Croatian with a Koreanization, uh, uh, radix, uh, roots, you know, rerouting, rerouting. It's Polish politics. Uh, it is in English uh, translated as indigenization politics, launched by Bolsheviks in the 20s. So, as the creator of the nation, not only of the nation, of Ukrainian society, of Ukrainian society. At the same time, Bolsheviks created a, 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 a Ukra Ukrainian society, but introducing universal health care, education, and social security benefits, as well as the right to work and housing, that is, the forms of social welfare state. At the same time, they supported what is today understood as westernization or a pro-European policy of women's rights that were greatly, uh, uh, greatly increased through, through new laws designed to wipe away, away centuries-old inequalities. Needless to say, Bolsheviks decriminalized homosexuality too. This is the policy which Putin now, almost 100 years later, has been reversing together with the reintroduction of, of Tsarist imperialism. But as you know, they protect Lenin. But those who should, should have really protect and praise uh, Lenin as the most important historical figure for the national liberation, they destroy these monuments. Where, how, how is the confusion possible? It's not difficult, you know, what I, what I have found, you have in Wikipedia. I, I mean, everybody knows it, but it doesn't function. Knowing all that, which is not difficult at all, one, one should have expected uh, the opposite, that the na nationalist, pro-European, as they are called, you know, masses in the West guard and protect Lenin's monuments, while those pro-Russian thugs, as, as you know, in the Western media, you, you, you have, you have uh, freedom-loving uh, pro-European uh, Ukrainians in the, in the West and Russian thugs in the, in the East. So <clears throat> they should have uh, 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 destroyed them. But Lenin, as everything else in the post-communist political reality, has been reduced to a field of cultural identity. He's a Russian and no other meaning whatsoever. He is there protected as being Russian. Moreover, the whole conflict, which is now on the fridge of a bloody civil war, appears as a conflict between the West and the East, pressing people violently 
into an exclusive decision between both. You know, this is not a question, are you pro-Western or pro-Eastern? You must fight. You will die and you will kill deciding on which side you are. This is the war. This is now, you know, this whole question about where la finalité d'Europe, where, where the Europe should finally, should find its, its, its limits in cultural, political, historical, you know, and people, intellectuals, uh, cultural theorists, political theorists were discussing can we allow Muslims also to be part of it? Do they belong to the cultural identity of Europe? What are the European values? Where does, where uh, do European values end finally? Where are the limits? Of course, there are political limits. Where the blood, now, <laughs> where it's, it's, it's political conflict which defines the boundaries of, 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 of the project. And we have been waiting now to, to finally face these this, this, this limits, limits of Europe, not in terms of values, but in terms of a civil war, of a new, not only Eastern, but also Western, uh, <coughs> remilitarization of the, of, the, of the late capitalism. <coughs> uh, so, <coughs> The only democratic alternative that has been left to the in U Ukraine now, an alternative for which is already now too late, was to choose between the pro-European and the pro-Russian oligarchs. As you know, there are only oligarchs there in the politics. Even the new, uh, new, new uh, 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 promising uh, president from the, from the West, uh, who is uh, <coughs> in the polls the best. Uh, <coughs> Placed is a chocolate, uh, chocolate king, uh, o o o oligarch of, of the, this food industry, and uh, the governor of the East is also an oligarch. So there are only oligarchs. For me, you know, uh, Yanukovych is an oligarch, and and uh, this uh, <coughs> lady is also also an oligarch. There are only oligarchs politically. You can only choose among oligarchs. What is an oligarch if not a thug of the post communist transition. Oligarch is, especially in Western media, depicted as a figure of a belated, not yet properly modernized, normalized, civilized, democratized, democratized and westernized wild east. You know, corruption, inefficiency, not sufficient productivity, and oligarchs. Recently, really uh, three weeks ago, article in Guardian reported about five richest families in Britain who are worth more than poorest 20 percent. Yet nobody speaks about Western oligarchs. You have five families that have accumulated more wealth than the 20 percent of the poorest uh, 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 Britons. But there are no oligarchs in the West. And you even know that l less than 100 billionaires in the world are uh, more rich than, than half of the human <laughs> population on the earth. Which we, you know, these are uh, inequalities have no, have no meaning whatsoever in the West. But, you know, in the East there are oligarchs. <clears throat> well, I said, nobody speaks of Western oligarchs. Or what is even worse, it seems that nobody, neither in the East nor in the West, revolts against them, and even less against what has made them oligarchs. The process of criminal privatizations that is both in the West and the East conceived of as a post-historical, extra-ideological, non-political, and post-social, which means completely invisible, moment of a good old historical necessity, which liberalism projected as its ideological element into a Marxist dogmatism, only to make use of it for its own purposes. To conclude, there is an interesting Kant's argument about French Revolution from, from uh, uh, his essay, 
the conflict uh, uh, of faculties, the Streit der Fakultät. He argues that the truth to me is historical event, the of French Revolution, lays in the gaze of the passive onlookers outside of the event who are not who are not uh, uh, directly involved. That it, uh, that it is in, the, in their enthusiasm for this event, he meant Kant the Germans at that time, at the end of the 18th century. <clears throat> so the, the true meaning of the event of the revolution is in the gaze of the passive onlookers, not in the deeds of those who actively participate in it. Only if these pass passive onlookers recognize in the in this event, a progress towards the, the, the better, as, as Kant uh, puts it, in the form of a tendency of the humankind as a whole, this ev event will acquire a historical meaning and become itself a historic event. So the meaning of a revolution is not in the Slovenian philosopher Rado Rika at the beginning of the 90s interpreted in a similar way, using this Kant's uh, concept, the so-called democratic revolution in the Eastern Europe. Now, it were now, according to Rika, passive uh, Western onlookers who enthusiastically identified with the revolution. East at that time, you know, looking at, 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 at all these uh, 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 Velvet revolution, velvet, velvet, velvet revolutions, uh, and then later, you know, these orange revolutions, rose, rose revolutions. revolutions, you know, these colorful and uh, and and, and uh, uh, fashionable, you know, uh, textile, etc., revolutions, and they were, you know amazed and, 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 and enthusiastically welcomed, identified with revolutions, or more precisely, they identified with the, this is Riha's argument, identified with the gaze of the Eastern revolutionaries, uh, concretely with their naive belief in democracy and modern capitalism, to which the Westerners had rather a cynical relation. You know, they knew that it is not that perfect, but they loved and endorsed enthusiastically the love of the Easterners, naive love for democracy and capitalism. But the question is, was it enthusiasm? Were they really looking at history in actu? A history as subject that was creating something new, as was the case for Kant uh, with the French Revolution. Uh, 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 history is subject uh, that was bringing the world towards the better in terms of a tendency. Or was it rather a nostalgic gaze that looked down to the belate, belated East striving to catch up with them, with these passive onlookers? Or was it the memory of the West looking down to history of the East as its own past. This is the difference. Those Germans who together with Kant were looking at the event of French Revolution saw in this event their desired future. Today's Westerners saw in the revolution, revolutions of the East nothing but their own past. So the East is defined in terms of a misdevelopment. Perhaps we could define the West in terms of a missed revolution. So the so-called democratic revolution of 1890 has been made halfway. To quote Saint-Just, those who make revolution halfway only dig their own graves. This is what we should keep in mind today when in Ukraine, precisely today, while we are sitting in Odessa, they are digging graves for the fresh killed yesterday. The graves that are being dug now 
because the revolution was made halfway by both the West and the East. Sorry for uh, <laughs> 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 